Midlands Today Show with Will Faulkner. Midlands 103. Now, I wasn't here two weeks ago when they started doing this, but apparently this is where we get to drink wine and talk about films. Well, happy days. Uh, you can hear the clinking of glasses here in the background. We have with us Trevor Fisher, the retail manager with R Wines Direct, based in Mullingar. John Eustace is our highly paid movie reviewer. <laughs> How are we doing, guys? Good, thanks, Will. Morning, Will. So let's start with the drinks, first of all. Yeah. Im important stuff, John. Not Absolutely. that the movies are on. Oh, no, way more important. Go ahead. <laughs> per well, what we're going to look at this morning is two wines from New Zealand. Um, New Zealand, we find, is becoming a, a hugely popular region for us in Wines Direct. Um, just the style of the wines. People love the really fresh, crisp whites and the slightly lighter style of reds. Um, but what we're going to try first off um, is what New Zealand is famous for um, and that is a Sauvignon Blanc um, and this wine is quite simply named Anna uh, it's made from a 100% Sauvignon Blanc grape um, and these guys are situated in uh, the most famous part of New Zealand which is called Marlborough um, and we actually have this weekend we have the winemaker of this wine over so he's going to be in our shop from half four till half six tomorrow so if any of uh, any of your listeners will want to pop by and actually kind of have a chat and taste the wine and explain all the all the different little intricacies and um, how they go about all the effort that goes into making the wine that we can just enjoy it at our weekend when we when we come along I'm quite taken by this it's lovely actually mm. Mm. <laughs> Try, tried it already you're, you're a step ahead of me yeah, I'm, all, I'm always last <laughs> you, I spent too long talking you you're see. going to have to learn this, you know, as the weeks go on, I'll, I'll have to drink it before I come into the studio. I think that'll be that'll be the that'll be the plan. That'll be a very interesting um, conversation. So, what you find with Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc, um, particularly um, the the kind of typical style, would tend to be that they're they're very very sharp, very citrusy. Lots of gooseberries is another term that you'll hear, or grassy, and they can be they're all very very strong kind of sharp flavors. Um, and what we really really liked about this one is it's just a little bit more subtle a little bit more subdued. Um, so instead of having those really, really sharp flavours, it's got something a little bit more tropical about it. So mm. something a bit like pineapples and peaches, but it's really, really refreshing. Um, As a matter of interest, John, how much do you know about wine? I know how to drink it, Will. That's about it. Yeah, the same honest. here. Yeah. So when I hear terms like grassy and so on, I'm not really sure what they mean. And a lot of people are wine connoisseurs, I'll grant you, but a lot of people are wondering, <laughs> right, there's sometimes a bitter wine that has a nasty aftertaste. And there are wines that don't. Yeah, and ho hopefully you find this one falls into the category that it, that it doesn't. No, no um, aftertaste. Well, it should be none unpleasant anyway. <laughs> That's it. I mean, the whole thing is that the wine, the flavour of the wine should linger in the mouth for, for quite a long time. Otherwise, before you get the glass back on the table, the flavour's gone and you're looking for, looking for another mouthful again. Um, so with this wine, you get lots of really lively tropical fruit flavours and they really fill the mouth up. It's like there. It's like this little party taste experience going on in the mouth. It's really mouth filling and really refreshing. But those flavours then linger around for, for a long time, but they stay really pleasant. And what you'll find with some maybe slightly poorer quality wines is that the the start, the first couple of seconds of the flavour might be lovely. And then a little bit further on, you get lots of acidity and the mm. flavour disappears. So the flavour changes into something that's a little bit unpleasant, whereas it should stay the same and stay really enjoyable the whole time until all the flavour disappears. Maybe mm. so it's 20 or 30 seconds wine later. So causes that to happen, is it? Uh, the pH would, would refer to the level of acidity, yeah. Mm. Um, but Sauvignon Blanc, including this one, would tend to have quite a high level of acidity. The problem comes in when you have really high acidity, but the quality of the fruit wasn't that great, so the flavour isn't there. Because what will happen is the flavour of the fruit, if it's really, really good, mm. will balance up and completely overshow the, the acidity. So what you should get is lots of flavour. You might notice the acidity a little bit, but it shouldn't become you know mouth puckering and almost painful level of acidity at the back of the throat yeah. which you can't find with uh, some wines uh, th this is it the bottle in my hand now that's the red you have in your oh, hand there the actually at the Sorry. moment <laughs> <laughs> you put the wrong glasses on this morning Oops. I think there's uh, the that's the white which is just called just called Anna yeah there was one important figure I wanted to check and it's 13 and a half percent that's it <laughs> okay that's uber important John your verdict I like it it's kind of it's a cross between a you know, a Sauvignon and a Chardonnay. It's, it's not too sweet. But you don't have to say it's nice. Either. You're taller and bigger than him. Uh, I, like it. I would have liked a bigger glass, to be honest. I would like more wine in it. But other than that, no, it's, it's pretty nice. Yeah. So we've two wines to get through. We've two wines to get through, yep. Right. Um, and we've two movies to get through as we well. We do, yes, indeed. So where do you want to begin? Okay, well, sure. Uh, we've two films this week. Uh, Super 8, which uh, started in the cinemas last week. I think it's the number one film in the country at the moment. And then Rise of the Planet of the Apes, which is opening, I think, tonight. Um... 
So we can start off maybe with Super 8. Yeah, I heard Anne-Marie Kelly on The Breakfast Show and Ashling O'Rourke in the newsroom have a chat about it yesterday. Mm-hmm. Anne-Marie was blown away by it, loved it. Yes. Ashling w- liked it, but wasn't blown away. Right. So were you blown away? <clears throat> I was, I absolutely loved it now, to be honest. Um, it's one of these really old-fashioned films. I don't know if people know much about it. There's been a good bit of talk because it opened in America about a month ago. Um, it's written and directed by a man called J.J. Abrams, who wouldn't be familiar. His name would be, wouldn't be familiar, but his product would His name be. would be familiar to Star Trek fans. His name would be familiar to Star Trek fans. He also created Lost and uh, another TV show called Alias. <clears throat> so he wrote and he directed this one, and it's produced by Steven Spielberg. So it's really, it's, it's uh, how would I say it? It's like a classic film that you would have seen maybe 20, 25 years ago. Uh, very, very much like a Steven Spielberg film. Um, it's set in a small town in America. <clears throat> it's about a bunch of kids who witness a train crash. They're in the process of uh, filming a, a kind of an amateur movie with a Super 8 camera. Super 8 is kind of like the, the ancestor of, uh, of home yeah. movie making. I was wondering what the Super 8 connection was. Yeah, like before you had uh, tape uh, video cameras, you had uh, Super 8 ones. Right. I was wondering, was it a famous five kind of thing? <laughs> there were eight lead <laughs> characters. There were eight of them, yes, indeed. Uh, so basically, it's, it's just about them witnessing this train crash in their small town and uh, some strange goings on that happen then afterwards. Mm. So it's good. It's brilliant. Yeah, I absolutely loved it, to be honest. Uh, it took me back. Uh, I grew up with films like E.T., uh, Close Encounters, Jaws, uh, The Goonies, things like that. Mm. If you like those kind of films, I think you'd really, really like it. It's very uh, nostalgic. The music is the same. The kids are, they're all, you know, they're all getting into adventures all the time. They're all riding around on bicycles. Are you know? they good actors? They are very good. Uh, mostly a cast of unknowns. There's one well, well, not well known. Her name is Ellie Fanning. She's the little sister of a an actress called Dakota Fanning, who'd be quite well known now at this stage. Uh, she was in the Twilight films and War of the Worlds. Other than that, you wouldn't recognise anyone in the film at all. And they're all terrific. A top up there, Trevor, if you don't <laughs> mind. And while you're topping that up, <laughs> <laughs> let, let's have a listen. According to my Uncle Seth, an accident like this is exceptionally rare. It wasn't an accident. What? There was a truck on the train tracks. Are you serious? Like driving on the tracks? There. Pickup truck to where the train is. That's impossible. Obviously, it isn't. Oh my god. I know that truck. Oh, guys. Is that him? Yeah. It's him. Who? It is. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Who is it? Dr. Woodward. D- Dr. Woodward, the science guy? Uh, biology. Honors biology. Wow. I'm, I'm not in his class. We know. Shut up, Carrie. Just one point that Anne Marie made on the breakfast show yesterday set off an alarm bell. She said you wouldn't want to go in as a critic, just go in and be absorbed by it. So, is it one of these films that you forgive its flaws because of the feeling, or is it genuinely without flaws? I don't know, to be honest. I was expecting a lot of it because I, I'd be a big fan of your man's, although I thought Lost now was was a mess after the first couple of series. But I think he's been a very good director since he started making movies. Uh, I was really, really looking forward to it. And as I said, I was kind of a fan of all of those films already. Uh, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Um, <clears throat> I was a little bit worried that kids who, you know, I'm 38, so I, I've grown up with these kind of films. But I was worried that kids who, you know, wouldn't have seen The Goonies or wouldn't have seen E.T. mightn't like it so much. But certainly the feedback so far has been uh, very positive. Have you been to see it, Trevor? I haven't yet, no, but I do I do want to go and see it. Out of everything that's out there at the moment, I've heard, heard great reports. And talking to John this morning is kind of... Yeah, maybe maybe put it on the plans for the weekend now. I think so. Exactly, it's all very positive. Did you watch Star Trek? Uh, in new parts, movie. in the new one, no. The new movie, no. Ah, you have to see it again. That's it's, another JJ. Abrams. It is. It's yeah, oh no, it's great. No, it's fantastic, and he's totally you know re-energized the whole franchise. Apparently, there are a few gaffes. Uh, I've been told by people in the know that they use Walkmans in the film, and Walkmans weren't invented for at least another year afterwards. Oh, so you can be really critical about things. You can, are you, you can one of these people who goes through movies for the flaws? But I was talking to somebody recently who had spotted it. Yeah, I, I love picking those faults <laughs> out as well. I have to admit. 
OK, we're going to review some red wine in just a moment and we'll be turning our, our attention to the rise of the apes. Uh, Trevor, fill us up again there, will you? We have in studio Trevor Fisher, retail manager with Wines Direct. John Eustace is our movie reviewer. We're moving on to red wine, which we will wash down by watching the rise of the apes. So, red wine, first of all, Trevor. We were chatting during the break. I was trying to figure out the terminology. People are complaining about heavy and rich wines, these sort of sticky, overpowering wines. Yeah, it's a it's a trend we've found a lot over, I'd say, the last 18 months or two years now, whereas at one point um, we would have found, you know, people would have used phrases like, you know, it had to be rich, heavy, full-bodied, spicy, or else the, the guide of the alcohol on the bottle was a key factor. So if somebody picked up a bottle and saw that it was 15%, that was automatically decision made. You know, that meant it was going to be a really, really good yep. wine. You know, maybe some logic in there, depending on what you're looking for the bottle for. Are you following um, all this too, John? Oh, I am. Okay. <laughs> but <laughs> what we've actually found now over the last year and a half to two years is constantly every day we would get requests for either deliberately lower alcohol or for slightly more mellow, easier to drink wines that aren't as heavy and, and gutsy. Um, sometimes some red wines that you'll, that you'll try after you've taken a couple of mouthfuls, particularly if you're trying to drink it on its own rather than with food, that you'll find that you have this coating on your teeth, which is called tannin, and it makes your mouth feel very dry and very chewy, basically. Um, and a lot of people seem to be trying to, to move away from those sort of very heavy, very powerful sort of wines towards something a bit more, mm. a bit more mellow and elegant. But does um, it depend on, on the occasion and what you're eating and so on? Red wine can complement certain foods if it's quite strong. It can very, very much so. Yeah, very much so. I mean, I would still say, and we would see this quite a lot as well, um, that if people are planning a particular meal, that they try to match the wine accordingly. Um, if you drink 70% maybe of your wine, maybe a glass on its own in the evening watching films or whatnot, you're going to want something that's a little bit more mellow and easier to drink. But all of a sudden, if you're having, you know, big, robust steak off the barbecue at the weekend or something spicy and you go for the same kind of mellow, easygoing mm. wine, the food will completely overpower the wine. So you, you do need to, to match a little bit accordingly, but that's something that, um, that ourselves or any good wine shop should be able to, should be able to help okay. people so out with. This is a bit lighter. Yeah. So this is a little bit lighter, yeah. This is, um, this is again from New Zealand um, and this is made by one of my favourite winemakers that we deal with, a gentleman called Paddy Warthwick. Uh, quite a young guy, but really, really fun um, and absolutely superb and meticulous and everything that he does. Um, and this wine is made from a grape that some people may not have heard of, which is called Pinot Noir. Uh, it's very famous in Burgundy and France, but New Zealand are having really, really big success with it now as well. Um, and you can even tell from the from the colour of it in the glass here, I know obviously listeners can't see it, but instead of being one of those really dark wines that you, you can't possibly see through, they always seem yeah, to well be Yeah, well, I can see my fingers at the far side. Exactly, yeah. It's, it's more of a ruby red colour, you know. It's a much lighter, more subtle colour. And that's partly due to the, the type of grape, um, and also just due to the climate that it grows in. It grows in slightly cooler climates, so it doesn't need to be really, really hot and really overbaked for it to produce mm. nice, elegant styles of wine. What do you make um, of it, John? It's, it's light. I think I'd prefer it just a little bit heavier, to be honest, but um, it's, it's definitely nice. I'd say, I'd say um, it's something that you could have on its own. I don't know if I'd want to have it with food. Would that, would that make any sense? What I really like about it food-wise, I would, this is the sort of wine that I, I personally would, would drink on its own quite a bit. Mm. Um, but I almost find that, that this wine in particular, it's a really good example of Pinot Noir without being too expensive. Um, both the wines are in and around the 12 euro mark. Um, with this wine, it's almost like a tale of two halves. When you when you take your first mouthful, you get this really nice kind of cherry and strawberry fruit flavour. It's not these really dark, kind of black currant jammy flavours or anything yeah, like it's that. It's not your typical red wine taste. No, but then after those lighter kind of fruit flavours disappear, you get a bit of a savoury character coming in. So something a little bit herby, basically, mm -hmm. um, something like rosemary or sage that just kind of finishes it off. So food wise, um, I actually think this works incredibly well with lamb, particularly if you roast lamb with you know various herbs and things like that. Then when you get that slightly herby element of the wine coming in at the end, mm -hmm. the two actually match up really, really I was well. Say, I couldn't imagine it with my pasta now and some parmesan dropped over it. No, I mean, I think that the, the herby side of this one or the savoury edge to it will probably clash there yeah, just a, maybe, just a maybe little maybe bit, lamb, you know. Right, yeah. um, but certainly with, with lamb, even with pork, I think it works very well as well. Um, but it is certainly something that can be sat down and, and drunk on its own in, a, in an evening. And I think because an awful lot of people maybe are, are staying in a little bit more, um, they might not be in the pub as often or they might, might, might not be out for dinner as often anymore. That wine at home isn't just uh, uh, something that has to be with the meal anymore. People mm. want to be able to have a glass of wine that's enjoyable 
but by itself without actually having to, to go and cook deliberately to go alongside it. So and um, wines like this are really, really popular at the moment. There's only one way to make up our minds, John, and that's to, to drink some more, <laughs> really. And, and while we're doing <laughs> that, back, you can have a listen to this clip from The Rise of the Apes. By 18 months, Caesar was signing up to 24 words. By age two, Caesar was completing puzzles and models designed for children eight years and up. At age three, Caesar continues to show cognitive skills that far exceed that of a human counterpart. Oh. Oh. He completed the Lucas Tower in 15 moves, a perfect score. I maintain my hypothesis that A, the green in his eyes indicates that the ALZ-112 was passed genetically from mother to son, and B, that in the absence of damaged cells that need replacing, the drug in his system has radically boosted healthy brain functioning. And he plays chess pretty well. Okay, John, so what's all that about? Okay, well, it's Rise of the Planet of the Apes opens tonight. It's 12A cert. Um, a lot of people will be familiar with Planet of the Apes. The original was made back in 1968 with Charlton Heston. I think I saw it on TV when I was about five or six. I don't have a huge memory of it. I have to confess, I've never watched it. Have you, Trevor? No, I haven't. I haven't seen it. I watched the, the remake with Mark Wahlberg, That's I think, right. wasn't it? But yeah. I didn't see the original one. They remade it there about 10 years ago. <coughs> Didn't have a huge amount of success with that. They had actually made four sequels to the original during the late 60s and 70s. Um, and there's a huge following for them out there. People have, you know, amazing facts and trivia. As you bump into the wrong person in the pub and bring up Planet of the Apes, you'd be amazed at the useless information that can be imparted. But uh, but this one's actually very, very good. Um, the 2001 one wasn't great, even though it was made by Tim Burton. It did fairly well, but... Nothing really came of it afterwards. This is a completely different uh, ball game altogether. Uh, it's a first, second time director, a uh, new guy called Rupert Wyatt. It's been a big hit in America. It's been very well received by the critics and there will definitely be a sequel, I would say, judging by it from mm-hmm. the end. I don't want to be giving away the end of the film, but definitely okay, leaves so room Okay, so it open. leaves the option open. It definitely leaves the option open. Um, it's, it's very good. Even though it's 12A, there are some really tense scenes in it. Um, I did find the, uh, some quite unnerving bits in it. Um, it's a very good thriller. Um, the story's a little bit far-fetched. It's about a scientist who's um, trying to create a cure for Alzheimer's and that he's using apes as the, right. you know, as the guinea pigs. I saw the trailer and just it was on the small screen and I was looking at the CGI and I thought from time to time it didn't look too convincing now on the big screen was that the case? I thought the CGI was excellent in it now to be honest um, it's the same lads who did Lord of the Rings and King Kong and actually the, the main ape character in this uh, his name is Caesar and uh, the face his face is done by Andy Serkis who did Gollum in yeah. Lord of the Rings and Kong himself and he doesn't talk for virtually all the film. It's all about expression and everything like that. But it's it's completely seamless. And then when there are a few kind of big action scenes that you probably saw on the net involving, you know, the apes escaping and, you know, revolting, um, you wouldn't notice it. You really wouldn't. I thought it was incredible. Because they did, they were trying to figure out how they were going to film the, the apes, whether they could use actual live mm. animals um, or they were going to do people in uh, suits like they did with the um, with the original and like they did with the remake. But they decided the best thing to do would do uh, motion capture, like with the, the Lord of the Rings and with Kong. Make it more I, realistic. I thought it, I thought it looked terrific. Now I, the, the screen I saw it in was pretty good quality as well, and you wouldn't really notice unless you again will unless you are really nitpicking. You know, if you're really looking for the. <laughs> The flaws in Which the Which we do. <laughs> uh, other than that, no, I thought it was great. The special effects are brilliant. Andy Serkis is terrific, like best performance. Like again, the cast are fairly the fairly unknown. James Franco will be fairly well known now at this stage. But um well, the cast really of King Kong was fairly unknown as well. It was Jack Black now was in was in King Kong. He was. And um, who was that blondie girl who was played the lead? Uh, Naomi Watts. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes, you're smiling Sorry. there. Uh, lost lost <laughs> my train of thought there for a minute. I'll be in trouble again now. Okay, so you would you would recommend? I loved it. To be honest, it's probably the best sort. Like I loved, um, I loved Super Eight as well. I thought that was that was terrific. This is this probably uh, this more of a summer blockbuster. It's got all the ingredients, big budgets, loads of special effects, <laughs> loads of uh, action set pieces, and uh, fantastic film. Excellent. <sighs> to have with a glass of wine. <laughs> glass of wine, movie. You can't do better than that. Off away for a Thursday morning, isn't it? <laughs> Indeed. Every Thursday, by the way, if you are listening now, we do not recommend this if you are driving, etc. 
you have to put in all the usual precautions. Too right. We'll be back in two weeks' time to talk about more wine, more movies. If there's anything you want to suggest for tomorrow's programme, we have a special Midlands Today show coming from Beachfield Healthcare in Port Leash, where we'll be looking at various implements and gadgets and tools to help people who have disabilities or who are maybe old and not fancying some of the rigours of day to day, anything that can make it a little easier, some aids, if you will. And we'll be exploring them tomorrow from nine o'clock onwards. Trevor and John, thank you very much for coming in to us.